name is Wasim Al Sindi, and I'm the janitor at an organization called the Zero X Salon. And uh, today, uh, Eugenio and the um, solar punk uh, RC3 crowd have kindly invited me to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the latest state of some uh, work in progress research around a new topic for the salon that we're calling the indifference engine. And uh, the um, purpose of this is to work towards an ecological characterization of Bitcoin. So we will, without any further ado, roll straight in. And so uh, this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully some of these things will make a bit more sense as we uh, go on. So to phrase a coin, we all know about the difference engine, right? Babbage, Lovelace, um, and so on. But why indifference? And so uh, to uh, uh, exemplify this, I've taken a quotation from a a recent um, poem by a, a, a collective offshoot of the Zero X Salon called the Cryptographic Poetic Researchers Union, the CPRU, and I'll read it to you now. So fractals don't care about your feelings, systems disregard their externalities, and formalisms cannot reason about the real. And so here's the kicker. Aside from a single very coarse feedback mechanism it's called the difficulty adjustment algorithm, Bitcoin is essentially insensate. It cannot care about what happens outside of its uh, borders outside of its uh, environs, only that the piper is paid. And it's paid in this way that we call thermoeconomics, which we'll get to a bit later. And so here's the TLDR, the Bitcoin pits capital and ecology against each other in a prisoner's dilemma style paradox that could tip the balance in favor of a hot house earth. And so uh, this is very hard for me to say because I was one of the people banging the drum for Bitcoin for many years, seven years or so. Um, and uh, I will explain to you and hopefully impress upon you that there is a value and a worth to Bitcoin and there is a, a need for uncensurable, ungoverned means of digital value transfer. But the, the cost that we might have to pay to uh, keep Bitcoin running is arguably too great for this planet to bear. OK, so let's talk a bit about motivations. And so, as I said, I'm a janitor at this uh, loose uh, collective organization called the Zero X Salon. We don't really know what it is yet, but we're thinking of it as this a tentacular um, post-disciplinary assemblage of entangled concepts and methodologies. So we are an informal research collective approaching unusual topics um, and trying to uh, break down epistemic boundaries, bringing people from all kinds of different uh, places and creating an informal space for unstructured uh, discussions um, to explore unusual topics. And we are um, holding discourse events, the salons themselves, or we are writing, we're producing artistic outputs. And one of the uh, interesting things of being the salon is based at uh, Trust, this uh, multidisciplinary workspace in Berlin. And the interesting um, thing is that many of our salon and trust colleagues have actually worked very closely with Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and blockchain technology for many years. And uh, there are quite a few tales to tell. And so there's a magic card, there's some kind of art piece behind me on the screen. And let me read you a little bit more from one of these poems. Accumulationism as a mode of being. The decentralized death drive is indifferent to your plight. Nagasaki sunrise for all eternity. Now, those are pretty strong words. So let's see if there's uh, some someone has got something to back them up with. So there's this thing called Bitcoin. You might have heard of it. Uh, it's a cryptocurrency. It's a network of computers that speak the same language, a protocol. And through the uh, implementation of this protocol, a series of um, uh, machinic and algorithmic processes take place, which lead to the creation and redistribution of these um, cryptographic um, abstractions of value that people call tokens or coins. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the graph that you see on the screen is what's called the hash rate. This is um, an, in, uh, an indirect proxy of a measurement of the amount of energy going into Bitcoin to defend it, to keep the, um, to, the, the sanctity of the transaction history um, maintained. <clears throat> so Bitcoin is this extremely defensive network that requires this uh, constant uh, input of energy uh, for uh, security reasons, for coin distribution reasons, and also uh, because it has no way of generating randomness uh, internal to it. And so, uh, you know, what, do we, what should we make about all this Bitcoin stuff? So, like, we all heard about Bitcoin, uh, you know, a few years ago. People would have stopped talking about it, and it kind of went away. Now it seems to be back. So we are hitting all-time highs in terms of the price. Uh, last time I checked, the price is around $27,000, which gives Bitcoin a nom nominal value of the network has a nominal value, all the tokens put together, of approximately half a trillion dollars. So that is quite a lot of money. OK, and so here is uh, the first of a series of provocations uh, around the indifference engine. And I'll read to you uh, the quotation again from uh, the Cryptographic Poetics Researchers Union on the card. 
The elephant in the room grows less restless as the air fills with soot. Some cheer it on as others choke and wheeze. The temperature rises again. And so this graph is we're watching the temperature rise. Just as when you look at the price of Bitcoin, that chart, as every time you see a green candle and the price goes up, the beast gets thirstier. Wants more energy to defend it because the honeypot that this network is defending um, get, grows larger. This is actually the biggest computing honeypot and biggest monetary honeypot on the planet at half a trillion dollars. If you could hack this thing, say with a quantum computer on some pre-quantum signature schemes, then um, you know this thing would lose all of its uh, uh, um, perceived value. Okay, so. Uh, here's a provocation that we wrote or that we've you know, drafted and we're in the middle of writing uh, for Bitcoin. And you can see that Bitcoin here is pictured as a black hole, as a naked singularity, as uh, something with a hard boundary uh, beyond which we cannot, uh, a reason beyond. And there's a reason why we've uh, used that analogy and we'll come back to that a bit later. In fact, even Bitcoin is quite proud of this analogy for other reasons. So let me read to you what's on the, what's on the screen. As Bitcoin surpasses previous price records and re-enters mainstream consciousness following several wilderness years, the 12-year-old cryptocurrency appears to have arrived in the eyes of the market. The value proposition of an ungoverned, unsensual digital means of value transfer is clear for all to see, but can our planet afford the thermodynamic price tag? To maintain the integrity of the transaction record, the Bitcoin network creates a hard boundary to the outside through exacting validation requirements. There is no sensitivity to the consequences of the thermoeconomic challenges it issues. This inability of mined cryptocurrencies to differentiate the energy sources used to secure them has led to criticism as to their indifference to their ecological externalities. And so this is where the indifference engine is coming from. Like Bitcoin can't care about what happens outside it. Just like a black hole can't care. It just wants to suck matter, uh, you know, um, matter energy let's say in the kind of Einsteinian sense, out of the external environment. And that's kind of what Bitcoin is doing. So we will take a little break and we'll look at a meme on the screen. And so you may have heard about this uh, movement called decentralized finance or DeFi. It's uh, all the rage at the moment, uh, particularly in some parts of the crypto blockchain space. And uh, really what I see here is um, a great deal of the replication of the systemic fragilities and problems of the traditional financial system um, being built atop um, some very experimental and uh, untested foundations. And so um, there's no uh, surprise when I see these projects failing and collapsing on a daily basis. So this is uh, House of Money Cards territory, if you ask me. Uh, in the middle, we have the Internet of Value, which is a more kind of um, neutral... Um, a platitude that's quite inclusive and welcoming of Bitcoin and all the other cryptocurrencies, uh, thinking that we can make a kind of a network society of all these different uh, coins. And that sounds great, but the problem is that all these things have for humans around them, like tribes or, or ideologies. And you know what humans are like when they have ideologies. And so, but the apotheosis of this meme really is the black hole of money. And I think this is you know, like what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is quite proud of calling it the black hole of money because they see that as a way of stripping away the impure, the central banking and the fiat uh, from um, humanity and from, from Earth. But uh, as a card carrying uh, a physicist who, who started his scientific career in the oldest research, astronomical research observatory in the world, I would caution people at hoping that their thing is a black hole. You may not want what that entails in reality. And so um, we had this funny conversation at Trust, uh, myself and a colleague, Joanna Pope, where we were talking about systems that barely work. And we had the joke that we would like to set up the barely working systems working group. And so if anybody would like to join that, then let us know. And I guess we'll have to start it and figure out what we do. Um, but the point I want to make here is that Bitcoin is kind of this kludgy solution, this highly suboptimal solution. To, uh, in, if you look at the component level, almost every piece of it from the kind of uh, the networking, from the economics, from the cryptography and from the distributed systems. Um, these are all very suboptimal and the, even the governance as well. These are all very suboptimal individual solutions. So it's a paradise for mousetrap designers. Like if you're a, an academic, a professor, a project called designer, you'll look at something in Bitcoin and think, that sucks, I can do it better. Here's my new mousetrap. And now obviously with um, everything outside of Bitcoin, people can make their own uh, tokens and cryptocurrencies and networks. You can print your own money. And so if you can build a better mousetrap and you can print your own money, you can see that there might be some incentives for, you know, grifters and all the rest of it. 
Um, but one of the points I wanted to make here that I, I, I skipped over earlier is that um, Bitcoin, even though it looks highly suboptimal, it's very resilient. Bitcoin is a cockroach. It's the cockroach of money, just as email is the cockroach of communication. And I think uh, I, with quite a high degree of certainty, if there was a nuclear fallout and a kind of apocalyptic uh, um, happening on this planet, uh, Bitcoin would be one of the first um, uh, global networks that would get back up and running. At first in localized areas as computers start to connect to each other and then as the linkages are made via whatever satellite, homing pigeon, uh, a smoke signal, who knows, uh, I, I think things would carry on. Anyway, moving on. And so some people describe Bitcoin as the impenetrable fortress of validation and they just mean that in a good way. That means it's very hard to cheat the system. There are no rulers but there's a great deal of very stringent rules and so transactions are checked to be valid before they enter the permanent record in a block and then as a miner creates a block um, and attempts to claim the reward the incentive the economics incentive the lottery incentive uh, that is checked by all of the other participants on the network to make sure no rules have been broken no shortcuts have been taken uh, and no um, uh, impropriety impropriety has been uh, has been occurring now of course when you have a set of rules you can still do some finagling underneath the surface whilst you um, pay heed uh, and lip service to the rules. But one of the points I want to make here is that this very hard boundary creates a hard um, delineation between the inside of Bitcoin and the outside in a cryptographic and computing sense, in a networking sense, system sense. But I think I would posit that this also creates um, like a, an economic penumbra of this hard boundary and a socio-political one as well. And we end up with these scorched earth mindsets. We have scorched earth economics this uh, thermoeconomic double jeopardy that we'll talk to talk about a bit later. We have this uh, scorched earth discourse. Log on to Bitcoin Twitter if you don't know what I mean. And we have this scorched earth governance and we'll get to all of these things in a moment. And they lead to this insularity of code and mind, which we're going to give a name to in a moment. And you know, so we all can see the value of having a stateless currency with no rulers. You know, there's no um, Plutarch or oligarch or overlord um, telling you what you can and can't spend on, like, you know, spending should be a form of speech, right? If you can say what you want, you should be able to spend how you want. Um, but even though there's no rulers, we still end up with uh, tolls and toll keepers, trolls and grifts. A lot. A lot. I mean, there's no permission to um, start any of these things, so they, a lot of people have ended up in this space doing that kind of stuff. It's all quite unpalatable. And so, one of the things I would like to posit is that Bitcoin is a form, or possibly the first form, of an algorithmic materialism. So it's using the um, algorithmics of the thermoeconomics as the incentive and the algorithmics of the um, proof of work of the cryptocurrency mining and to combine these things together, uh, the real and the virtual, to uh, create this um, synthetic uh, abstraction that straddles the real and the virtual, which is the, the currency, the cryptocurrency itself. So I would, I would argue that it's um, algorithmic materialism, and uh, we'll go even further with that in a moment. So here's another poetic interlude, and I'll just uh, take a water break before we start. Again from the CPRU. <clears throat> a black hole greater than the sum of its parts. The ultraviolet catastrophe of money. Rugged individuality meets naked singularity. Thermoeconomic double jeopardy. A game of Russian roulette with Alice, Bob, Sybil and Sock puppets. And that's also by the um, alias Satoshi Wept. And so, thermoeconomics, let's talk a bit about that. What does that word even mean? Well, here's a recent uh, usage of it uh, by a couple of Salon colleagues in a recent uh, explainer for um, cryptocurrency mining, which is quite relevant today. <clears throat> cryptocurrency mining is a thermoeconomic process employing proof of work and a parameterizable feedback mechanism, the difficulty adjustment we mentioned earlier, with direct incentives provided by block rewards, from a net algorithmically regulated network level issuance schedule alongside transaction fees. And the picture here is from uh, Politico, and these are um, uh, uh, engines, uh, uh, natural gas powered engines that are fueling um, Bitcoin miners, and they sit above um, fracking wells in places like um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Alaska. So Bitcoin doesn't care about where the energy comes from. It just wants energy. It doesn't care how dirty it is. It doesn't care if it's helping. It doesn't care if it's harming. In these cases, it might actually be helping, believe it or not, because a lot of the um, ga gas comes with this fracked oil, and a lot of it is just flared off. They just burn it and let it into the sky. 
and you have methane going into the atmosphere, that is not good from an ecological perspective. So maybe burning some of it in this like you know horrifically inefficient uh, diesel, you know, di di you know um, uh, carbon engines, combust uh, uh, combustion engines, is a, is a net, a net gain. But because I wanted, I just want to illustrate the point that Bitcoin doesn't care where the energy comes from. To Bitcoin, this could be coming from solar uh, plant, could be coming from nuclear power, could be coming from space uh, space harvesting, a Dyson sphere. It doesn't care. And so, this is what we were promised by all of these cryptocurrencies. We'll get rid of the rulers. We'll uh, be able to transact in freedom. We'll have this P2P egalitarian one CPU one vote utopia. But I think we're actually a bit closer to this, where we started, uh, the bosses of the Senate, the oligarchies and the plutarchies. I think we're probably a bit closer to that than we think. And we have these several kind of principal constituents in the Bitcoin network. Um, one of them is this developer technocracy, which we'll get to in a moment. And one of them is this mining oligopoly, the thermoeconomic cartel. And um, both of these things, I don't think they were necessarily anticipated by the creators and progenitors of Bitcoin, but those are the reality that we have to deal with now. And so here's a pyramid. We've all seen pyramids before. Um, I think that most human uh, uh, organizations seem to play out in this way by accident or by design. So you could argue that at the top of this thing are the um, people that found Bitcoin very early. And then, you know, there's other people that set up companies that do mining, that are the developers and so on. Then there is kind of your media personalities. Then you've got kind of that. Uh, People like me, talking heads, kind of bro, whatever, Bitcoin bros, ex-Bitcoin bros. And then you've got the kind of followers and the people that watch Bloomberg, tell them which coin to buy. And um, the people that casually log on to Twitter and have like, you know, five followers and things like that. So there is some kind of hierarchy here. And I'm, you know, speaking of it because I've moved through this hierarchy over the years. And I've also swept floors at some of the very highest levels. And so when you sweep a floor, you hear interesting things. And so, uh, one of the most interesting things about all this Bitcoin and blockchain stuff is that some people see uh, Bitcoin and blockchains and, and so on as a, a new instantiation, a new exemplification of a synthetic time or even a synthetic space time. And uh, for people that are interested in the philosophical work of uh, Immanuel Kant and everything that came beyond that, um, this is extremely interesting. So this is giving you a some kind of like a... Um, uh, a new yardstick, a new kind of time that is divorced from the outside time. And so uh, this is, uh, many people think that this proved Kant right. And there's this very beautiful picture of Emoto from uh, Anna Singh's book, Mushroom at the End of the World, uh, called Conjuring Time. So we will probably litigate the time thing another 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 time. Uh, but some of us have in, the, in the cryptocurrency space have been using these uh, spatio-temporal, thermodynamic and astral lenses for, for a number of years. Here's some um, old uh, tweets by this janitor uh, talking about blockchains as time machines uh, a couple of years ago. All right, meme break. So um, here's a very controversial philosopher uh, on the screen and uh, somebody that is very interested in Bitcoin and uh, the blockchain and space time. I suppose you could describe Bitcoin as a dark crystal if you were so inclined. And so, Unfortunately, um, the nice uh, animated image of cellular automata going around the screen here did not translate, but I will just leave you to imagine a Conway's game of life unfolding in front of us. And I will say that, you know, we are, at the salon, we have spoken a little bit about uh, moving beyond the natural and towards the synthetic. You know, what does a synthetic life form look like? What can it uh, do? What can it be? How can we tell if something is alive or not? And um, the... Uh, uh, researcher Alexandra Daisy Ginsburg has done quite a lot of work on this and this is an interesting uh, speculative um, uh, epistemology of um, how a new you know a taxonomic kingdom might exist uh, in kind of like a meta state above and across transcending the boundaries of uh, other living um, uh, kingdoms and families. Some people are starting to work on uh, trying to characterize the behavior of machines in the similar sense that we do with uh, human and non-human living things. And so this is like some of my colleagues and yours uh, writing this uh, machine behavior paper in, in Nature. And um, I won't go too much into this. We've discussed it at salons before. So this is building on work by Tim Bergen a couple of generations ago, where we're looking from the individual to the collective in terms of behavior, and then hybrids of individual collective behavior, and then also hybrids of machine or human and non-human or natural and non-natural um, forms of life 
whatever they may be. And so uh, let's um, now look at an interesting example of somebody trying to ascribe the agency of life to Bitcoin. And so this is uh, some work by a fellow called Ralph Merkel, and he's actually immortalized in the Bitcoin protocol because every block of the Bitcoin blockchain contains this thing called a Merkle tree, which is this hierarchical uh, space saving cryptographic construction, which um, proves in, in a quite an efficient way uh, how transactions are related to each other. And we need to do that for validation. As I said, the Bitcoin is a very strong uh, uh, validation um, uh, engine. And this is one of the components of that engine. So Ralph Merkel started off as a cryptographer. He's now a chemist. And the chemists are kind of sitting at the limit of life, you know, between physics and, and biology. And I say that with a little bit of experience, uh, having spent a number of years as a chemist with a PhD in chemistry. So let's read what Ralph Merkel uh, says here. So Bitcoin is the first example of a new form of life. It lives and breathes on the internet. It lives because it can pay people to keep it alive. It lives because it performs a useful service that people will pay it to perform. It lives because anyone, anywhere, can run a copy of its code. It lives because all the running copies are constantly talking to each other. It lives because if any one copy is corrupted, it is discarded quickly and without any fuss or muss. And it lives because it's radically transparent. Anyone can see its code and see exactly what it does. Now, I think there's plenty of food for thought in there, but um, one of the things I will say, going back to our point about um, Bitcoin's uh, uh, a very poor sensitivity, this feedback mechanism that it contains, um, you could argue that this is kind of an ad adaptive mechanism, but it, with, without a more sophisticated sensing, it's, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think it would qualify, meet the bar for any kind of meaningful definition of life. Um, one of the other things to say is that the point that was brought up in the salon by uh, our colleague uh, Sarah Friend is that um, Bitcoin has already reproduced itself through forks. And some of us have written papers about uh, the forks of Bitcoin and, and, and what we might learn from those. Um, but I would say that the, this um, network partitioning that creates these you know, blockchain forks, there's no um, opportunity for mutation evolution, nat naturally speaking, to improve the fitness you know, in this you know, progeny. And so um, this is what I would call a degenerate reproduction. This is not the reproduction of life. At best, it is a kind of prokaryotic um, you know, cell division, kind of naive, asexual reproduction at best. Okay, so there are some paradoxes within Bitcoin and with all of this stuff. And um, I just um, hope that we can uh, spend a little bit of time uh, unpacking some of those now. And, uh, you know, hopefully they'll bring up some questions that we can discuss uh, uh, either at the end of this talk or at a, at a, at a, a, a zero x salon event in the future. And so I'll read to you another um, stanza from one of the CPRU poems. Being at once anthropocentric hypercapital and subordinated machine socialism, where the abstract labour itself becomes the means of production, mindlessly grinding as the commons burn. For what? To fortify a barren walled garden, a moat without a castle, let alone a citadel. And that's a courtesy of Satoshi Wet. And so, we've said the first part here, that this is like, you know, hypercapital and transcendent machine socialism. So like, how can those two things mesh together in some kind of meaningful way? And others have written, you know, over the years, quite a lot about different um, philosophical angles within Bitcoin. So, you know, for example, Columbia has written on the politics of Bitcoin as, uh, you know, a vector for right-wing extremism. And others has more recently written about crypto communism and the kind of emancipatory potential for, um, uh, mostly other blockchains and, uh, and um, revolutionary praxis and so on. And so here's the kicker for me. I think you know, we can leave left and right politics out of this. 99% of the planet hates Bitcoin and for good reason. Bitcoin requires constant import of export and export of randomness to find blocks. This gigantic entropic generalization is the output of mining farms which soak up underutilized resources around Earth. The global consensus that Bitcoin desires and strives for every 10 minutes on average is the most expensive luxury in the universe. So there's a mic drop and uh, I will leave this on the uh, screen while I take a walk's break. So necro primitivism, it's time to go back to school and today's lesson is introduction to necro primitivism. So what the hell is necro primitivism? So 
We've been talking about this resistance to change inside the Bitcoin network through these validation requirements, through the difficulty of getting consensus to upgrade the networks. And this has given rise to what I call a necroprimitivist class inside Bitcoin, and it informs some of the behaviors of the social, political and economic aspects of the network. So let me read to you um, a little provocation on this um, necroprimitivist priest card on the screen. For now, there is only thermotechnics to centralize cosmic horror. A zero-sum machine of fire, sand and pressure, synthesizing scorched earth realities. The heat death of the universe passes us by as we languish in Plato's cave. So, here's a PSA. Is someone you know a necroprimitivist? Is somebody you know hiding a dark secret? Do, is, does the person you know exhibit a lack of imagination? Some Bitcoiners believe it's easier to imagine the end of the world than a new pro proving mechanism to replace the mining. Scorched Earth economics is another telltale sign. Bitcoiners hate central banking and fiat currencies so much that the heat of death of the universe is a preferable outcome. Scorched Earth politics, worshipping a developer priesthood and foretelling futures for minor semiotics. Now this might require a little bit of explanation. So when we talk about a developer priesthood, we are talking about the, um, the cathedral in the sense of open source software. And so th these are the wizards of Bitcoin, uh, which are mostly white American males, um, who are, are trusted with the uh, um, janitorial um, maintenance and um, uh, assurance of the code and the network that, that is implemented from it. And I have some experience of, uh, of speaking with these uh, janitorial and primitivist um, types because until quite recently, part of my uh, days were spent uh, raising money to pay their salaries. So I was sweeping floors in the priesthood uh, and so um, when you sweep floors, you hear things and you notice things. So we're going to move on now to the discourse and how that is scorched earth. So as you said about Columbia's book, there is this ultra libertarian bent going through Bitcoin. And I suppose that might be because the amount of coins that were distributed at the start before the first subsidy halving in the first four years of Bitcoin between 2010, 2014, when nobody knew about Bitcoin, 10.5 uh, of the 21 million coins were issued. And so the people that found Bitcoin very early have this enormous incentive to uh, keep things the way they are, to not let things change too much. And so there's this hyper individualist bet going through Bitcoin. And again, I can speak to this because I was also there for many years. And there's this, you know, this, these things result to this kind of zero sum community dynamics. And if you want to know what I mean, go take a trip to Bitcoin Twitter and see what a, a uncharitable, inhospitable place with low quality discourse that is. They've literally been having the same conversations for the last seven years, as long as I've been paying attention. And so this all re re results in this uh, overall resistance to change. So without the will to change on the social layer, like to convince the necro-primitivist priesthood, the developers, the minor oligopolists um, who control the, the resources, the hash rate, um, nothing is possible. Like you need the, the, the buy-in of these two stakeholders to make anything happen. And the economic side and the user side, well, apparently they're involved somehow, but um, the, that signaling is very coarse and very informal. I would suppose just um, restricted to who shouts the loudest on Twitter. And so this kind of so-called intersubjective consensus between users and the uh, developers and the miners is what's meant to reinforce the um, you know, trajectory of Bitcoin. But I would argue that this is a new form of theater that has replaced decentralization theater. And the signaling ground of Twitter has become a new uh, theater for uh, psyop battlegrounds. In fact, I think it's been like this for years. So, what's a necroprimitivist? I think you might still be looking at one. So here's me 18 months ago, moderating a panel at one of the premier technical Bitcoin conferences on economic and social risks. And standing, sitting beside me was the technical editor of Bitcoin magazine, Aaron Van Furden. And uh, we were both calling out the cultish nature of the Bitcoin community to their faces, you know, not just only to their, you know, the community at large. We're talking about the kind of VIP community of Bitcoin, people that go to all the conferences, that speak at all these things, that have 10 to a million, 10,000 to a million followers on Twitter, the thought leaders of Bitcoin. And they were lapping it up, laughing and uh, applauding. You can find this talk online if you so choose. 
And uh, more recently, and you can see I'm uh, it's a screenshot from another talk I gave not so long ago, where I was running uh, and founded and uh, edited a journal called the Crypto Economic Systems, which was based at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Media Laboratory at the Digital Currency Initiative. So I've um, been sweeping quite a few interesting floors, meeting a lot of these interesting uh, people that are very close to these networks that have a great deal of um, social, technical and uh, economic gravitas within these networks of networks. So let's talk about swans. So people always like to talk about black swans. And you've, I've heard people say that Bitcoin is a black swan generator, a black swan tractor. It's always spitting out these uh, crazy uh, event-based externalities. And I would argue that you could think of Bitcoin as a black swan, but more like a thermodynamic one. But let's talk about this white swan hypothesis, which a lot of people have spoken about, myself included. I had to go through some very embarrassing older talks to uh, dredge out my arguments um, as to the um, incentives that Bitcoin might provide towards the development of cleaner and greener energy. And um, on the uh, screen is a, uh, another card and there's a quotation there about like whose skin is in the game. And so obviously the black swan is a, is a Taleb aphorism and title of a book. And so is skin in the game. So the idea of skin in the game being like incentives are correlated to disincentives. So like, you know, you have to have something at stake in order to um, reliably be signaling your, the truth of your intentions. And so we were talking a while ago in the Trust Discord about uh, conspiracy theories and cults and movements and what the differences might be between these things. And uh, this person, Wasim Taleb, said, the difference between a movement and a cult is whether the skin in the game is your own and others. And that's something I want to impress upon you because some of the people in the stakeholder um, ecosystem of Bitcoin do have some skin in the game and some of them don't. Um, but that is not necessarily correlated with who holds sway whether explicit or implicit, and that's something that's very important to note. And so, we spoke about thermoeconomics and this incentive mechanism for the lottery, and that the, this feedback mechanism that regulates the difficulty is the only sensate connection in Bitcoin. And because the subsidy, the amount of coins that um, a miner gets for finding the winning the lottery every block, it's halving on this predetermined schedule every four years, there is this incentive double jeopardy that as the a number of coins become scarcer and scarcer, the amount of energy required to defend the network becomes greater and greater and greater. And this, uh, you know, it's no, it, this is kind of like a game of chicken. And so we don't know who blinks first um, or, you know, what happens when these two things crash into each other. And so we used to talk about Bitcoin as being a way to make payments. And uh, this was a, a, a form of a fast and cheap and uh, facile value transfer. And we had to walk back on that one because the transactions got expensive. Turns out space in the blockchain to tra confirm your transaction is a precious resource and people were willing to pay quite a lot for that. And so there became this rise of this narrative shift as uh, Lana Schwartz and others have discussed since 2013 of digital metallism. You could think of Bitcoin as digital gold. You've probably heard about this analogy. And you could think of this as an IO ideology. This is like a computational ideology. And we mentioned Columbia earlier. I'm going to read a little bit from uh, a quote of his from the cultural logic of computation uh, on the card. Computationalism underwrites and reinforces a surprisingly traditionalist conception of human being, society and politics. In other registers, we might imagine these views to have long been abandoned, in large part because their faults as part of the total account of human being have long ago been long ago demonstrated conclusively. And so, because Bitcoin has this inability to mitigate or even have awareness of its externalities, and because there is no alternative, there is no other consensus mechanism that has been proven at scale, computationally and economically, is there no alternative? Et tu, Margaret? We live in hope. Well, I've been waiting for, proof of, for Ethereum to move away from proof of work since it was first announced in 2014. Still waiting. So. We often hear this, and I've often said these things myself in, in times gone by. Solar energy and wind will save Bitcoin. The shuttered aluminium uh, plants next to Three Gorges Dam hydro uh, outlets will save Bitcoin. The green indexes say that most of the energy in Bitcoin is sustainable and renewable. Well, you know, I now know the people that wrote these reports, people like uh, Chris Bendingson and Michelle Rouse. And a lot of these reports are reliant on self-reporting and self-reporting is susceptible to Goodhart's law, which means that, you know, people may not report honestly. They may report for their interests rather than to report uh, altruistically. And then, you know, 
where do things like uranium and biomass come into all of this? Like we've been researching chemical industry externalities at Trust not in, in recent times. And a lot of the time people talk about biomass as a renewable energy. So one of my colleagues used to uh, develop um, power management algorithms at uh, the Drax family of power stations in the UK. And one of the things that they do is they do lots of renewable energy. But one of their renewable energies is um, wood biomass. It's processed wood that they chop up, then burn, and they plant some more trees. Does that sound green to you? I think they just do it so they can burn, they can use coal plants to burn stuff. Excuse me. You also have to remember that there are embodied costs to all of these things, like solar panels, the silicon has to come from somewhere, the exotic materials, uh, the photovoltaics have to come from somewhere. I have a PhD in photovoltaic technology. I watched the solar panel industry and technology develop at that same time that I was doing my research. We are still not there yet. Um, the, uh, there is only a marginal benefit of running solar panels that we have today when we do these life cycle analysis uh, analyses. Maybe one day we'll be making solar panels out of graphene or some other kind of you know, cheap uh, um, reproducible material that has minimal externalities. But until we get there, this is still um, problematic. And one of the worst things about Bitcoin, this is kind of like part of the very foundation of the house of cards that Bitcoin is built on, in terms of centralization anyway, is that there are only a handful of places you can actually fabricate um, semiconductors, silicon wafers to make computing chips. And so Bitcoin requires specialized computing chips. There is this enormous arms race due to these incentives to create a more efficient and uh, you know, more performant, more energy efficient and more perform performance efficient uh, uh, mining chips for these application specific integrated circuits, ASICs, uh, the Bitcoin mining machines that create these gigantic farms next to these hydro plants and wherever. There's only a handful of these plants in the world. Making one is very hard. You require a great deal of capital and a great deal of um, know-how. I know people that used to work on uh, silicon fabrication it is extremely, is a, is a business with extremely high barriers to entry. And so the problem here is if you want to make a Bitcoin mining chip, you need to have a friend at one of these places that will let you get your, um, your uh, production batch in the queue among the Sony's and the Apple's of this world, the Samsung's of this world. It's very difficult to do. So let's talk more about this white swan. So mining energy costs are mostly paid in fiat. The, the piper that the miners have to pay to win these Bitcoin rewards is mostly denominated in yuan or dollars or pounds or euros. And so the token price, the price of Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin matters. Every time the price of Bitcoin goes up, the prize on Bitcoin's head from this kind of um, uh, bounty that we discussed earlier, and also the um, incentives to defend the network against um, uh, against a 51% attacks against uh, att uh, honest attacks that are compliant in the protocol must increase. We must put more energy into this thing to keep it safe. It becomes more valuable. Makes sense, right? And so here's a, a, a quote from an old paper which tries to describe um, the value of a Bitcoin solely internal to the system. Okay. Considering the functionality of the Bitcoin network, the current value of one Bitcoin may be understood implicitly as the value of 150 seconds of the computational resource directed at defending the network from thermodynamic attacks and providing a high probability of assurance that the integrity of the canonical ledger will continue to be maintained. Okay, so. And let's wrap up now by taking this to the kind of logical endpoint. So if Bitcoin is this black hole and it wants to suck all the energy out of uh, you know, where, as far as it can see to its event horizon, where is that? So uh, there are these things in the universe that we call kind of constants and natural laws. Whether they're constant, whether they're natural laws is another matter. In fact, the most interesting uh, scientific talk I ever saw during my tenure as a, as a, as a physicist and chemist was by uh, John A. Popel III, Nobel Prize winner, uh, which was called Is Chemistry a Branch of Pure Mathematics? Where he took apart every single natural law and uh, fundamental constant that um, people would uh, shout out from the, from the lecture theater, armed with only a, a, a Sharpie and a piece of transparent uh, plastic on an overhead projector. And so um, the light from the sun takes eight and a half minutes to reach Earth at the, you know, near enough the speed of light. That is an upper limit or an asymptote, at least in our side of the veil. And so that's kind of like a hard limit of how far Bitcoin can go, like to the sun, basically. Like you know, imagine a circular radius from the Earth to the Sun and the other side towards Mars. 
But because of the way the lottery works, um, every second you move away from the economic center of gravity of Bitcoin, you're hamstringing yourself in this race against the other miners that are close to the center of gravity. Think about how high frequency trading works. People built computer exchanges next to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange so that they could shave milliseconds off their trading times and jump in before other people. And so this is what would happen in this thermodynamic lottery. If you even went just a few light seconds away to the moon, you would be at a disadvantage compared to everybody else. It's usually on a matter of seconds, the winning block versus another one. And so unless so much hash power is deployed off Earth that the center of economic gravity of Bitcoin moves also off Earth, I, I don't see how um, the, the network is constrained by the current parameters, things like the 10 minute block time and so on. And so Bitcoin mining in space may be nearby. Um, maybe we can make a Death Star, like maybe Bitcoin can be the Death Star. And so we all talk about Dyson, Dyson spheres and you know cold fusion and all these kinds of things. Sounds great, but like the planet is burning now, and Bitcoin is trying to suck all the air out of the room now. So even with all these things, it will still be a brute force thermodynamic arms race. Bitcoin requires a simple majority of all of the energy that it can see in order to know that it's in, in order to be secure. It doesn't know that it's secure, but in order to be secure. And so it just wants to suck all the energy out of the room. And so. The TLDR here is that Bitcoin, as this you know putative form of artificial life, if you believe or agree with Ralph Merkel, Bitcoin is in competition with natural life for the harvestable energy this side of the sun. And that means that, in effect, Bitcoin is not artificial life, it's artificial death. It's trying to suck all the oxygen out of the room, or the photons out of the room, or the energy out of the room, so that it may prosper and survive. And it doesn't care. It can't care about you. It can't care about me. It can't care about us. It can't care about our planet. And so um, this is the uh, where I'm going to wrap up this latest stage, uh, latest uh, interim state of uh, Zero X Salon topic number five, the indifference engine uh, research. Um, I hope it hasn't been uh, too uh, scatty and disorganized. I had very little time to prepare this. Um, and uh, I hope uh, that uh, you can join me for Q&A uh, after the talk now. And so uh, thanks very much for listening. Uh, this is an a, a archive picture of me uh, sweeping some floors. And uh, I work at the Zero X Salon, which is an informal research collective approaching unusual topics with post-disciplinary activities involving discourse, art and writing. If you'd like to know more about the Zero X Salon, please visit zeroxsalon.pubpubpubpub.org. And thanks very much for your time. There. Wasim, that was a, an amazing talk. Um, really, really heartwarming to see how things are evolving uh, for you in the last couple of months. <laughs> you sure? You've been there with me on this journey, Eric. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like a year ago, when we had this discussion back at Trust, I was uh, trying to, to poke through uh, some uh, ecological perspective, um, trying, to, trying to address this relation between the ecological and the economical. And, and uh, I really appreciate uh, the trajectory that you're taking. So, I think yeah. I let my thermodynamic defenses down between now and then. <laughs> it, 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 it's really, and, and it's lovely that it comes right after Christine's talk. I mean, uh, Eugenio, uh, my talk, uh, I changed the topic. I adapted it so that it fits it's ecologically, <laughs> uh, Christine and Wesley's talk. But it's like what I'm going to present is mm -hmm. kind of a, a, a very close resonance to what Wesley is, is discussing. So maybe. We should uh, get a few questions from the audience before I step in. Yeah, I think the audience have just a lot of comments. Uh, maybe now some of new, some of are coming up. I felt like quite a lot of them were more kind of polemic comments rather than things that we can we can discuss in detail. But hey, there are new stuff. still. Okay, here's one that I think might be interesting. It says uh, actually making Bitcoin CO two neutral would be very cheap, half a percent of the value at a very conservative uh, estimation. And I mean, that might be true, actually. It might be quite cheap to uh, green Bitcoin. But the problem is because Bitcoin is not sensitive to the energy that's going into it, as we've discussed, mm -hmm. how would you know? And so like all it takes is another kind of a marginal step down of some other non-green form of energy. To, and that would re-enter the mix just because of this kind of um, rational energy market that we mostly find ourselves with. Bitcoin is seeking the cheapest energy uh, and it doesn't really care what it is. Hmm. Cool. Um, 
uh, Satoshi, you are still polluting the planet with heat. You are still responsible. Now, this is an interesting point that we came to at the salon when we talked about algorithmic realism, which is like, you're a developer, you write some code, you put it on the web or GitHub or whatever, and then you disappear. You might die. You um, left the planet. Then somebody else implements your code or puts your code in somewhere, something else. Are you still responsible for what people use it for? Like, so Satoshi wrote some code and then Satoshi implemented a network and then disappeared. Are they still responsible? It's an interesting question. I think there is a Daniel S. Uh, sounds familiar. <laughs> Thanks for the talk, crypto will hunting. Do you see a possibility of decoupling Bitcoin's value from its energy usage? This is actually a really interesting question. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, and it actually seems to be a similar question to the one that goes around in the uh, degrowth world, which um, you know Christine will be very familiar with, on the decoupling of uh, econo economic uh, uh, prosperity and energy consumption. And it's actually kind of almost the same uh, thing that we're grappling with here. And the real question with Bitcoin, it, the way it works now, I don't think so. I don't think that's possible. I think the energy draining out of the system will be accompanied by a loss of confidence in the security of the system. And uh, unless there's some uh, other way of arranging or connecting the uh, cryptographic and the economic aspects of Bitcoin together, I just don't see how we're going to do that. Mm. Yeah, Christine, what about decoupling? What's your official or unofficial take on decoupling? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, just, I mean, like I, I touched upon in the talk, like we, um, we have achieved relative decoupling, like we, every, obviously, um, energy has become, become more energy efficient. Um, but the thing is, like, we're still aiming towards, um, like absolute GDP growth. Um, so that like means material throughput and often energy itself also like will simply consumption will continue to rise regardless of how like efficient we're being because we're demanding like ever more energy um so um yeah then people are arguing that app like sufficient absolute decoupling decoupling is possible but um, many people in the ecological sector argue against that because simply because we don't have enough time and we need to act now on climate change mitigation um so the, the simplest way to do that would be to lower like energy usage itself. Um, and because we're quite wasteful with it anyways. So um, I guess my personal opinion about um, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies that use energy system, or it's maybe just like a bit of a, a bit of a challenge is, is like, I, I don't consider something innovative unless it's ecological. So I don't, I don't consider um, proof of work innovative at all um like it, it, through the lens through my extremely biased lens um but i think that's just like a, maybe that's just a provocation I that's a good provocation christine what i might uh, counter with is say that um if proof of work may not be ecologically valuable uh, as it is but it may um provide a way forwards to something that does have an ecological value in an innovative sense i just think it's like it's pretty disappointing because when it was developed like we were you know we were well aware of these environmental issues so I just feel like at this, at this, in this day and age, like if you're going to call your, your work, uh, innovative, like it has to be aligned with civilizational longevity. Um, you know, and, and it's just, and that's my like very strong opinion about it. Um, but also like with Bitcoin, I don't know too much about it, but isn't like the majority of the wealth also held in very few hands. Like it kind of is mirroring the, the wealth disparity in society as is. And I, I also like, you know, propose people think on that metric um, and really, really think about whether or not this is going the direction we want it to go. If it's a response to 2008, 2009 recession, it shouldn't be containing external, you know, ecological externalities. It's it's not radical then, right? Like, yeah, so. there's a big, there's a big difference between um, where we, where the network was intended to go and do and achieve and the kind of grand vision of that and what it has achieved. So it's achieved more than its minimal promise, but it's fallen far short of its uh, maximal promise. So this was meant to be something very egalitarian, one CPU, one vote, like a computer democracy, a machine democracy. What we ended up with is a machine oligopoly, a machine cartel. <clears throat> the the uh, um, uh, industrialization of the mining wasn't foreseen originally. And so there weren't any fail safes put in 
uh, to mitigate against uh, centralization and, and uh, coalescence of, of power in that way. Um, the developer priesthood, which we talked about, I think that um, Satoshi would have been blind to that because Satoshi was one. Like, so this is something that was created in the person's image to perpetuate, uh, you know, small cadre of uh, expert uh, wizard people. And in terms of, oh gosh, where were we? In terms of the ecology, I mean, uh, people always shift the boundaries, shift the goalposts as um, the expectations and the reality diverge more from the Bitcoin we wish we had and the Bitcoin we ended up with. And um, at some point, um, people have to kind of take stock of the situation. This is kind of what I'm doing with this talk. Like I was one of these people banging the drums saying that the, the cost was worth it. All of this energy was worth it to have a stateless value transfer system. Um, but now I'm looking around and thinking, this is pretty high cost and it's increasing very rapidly. Uh, uh, look outside and um, the externalities seem to be piling up. Uh, and so at some point you have to make that value judgment and every person has to do that for themselves. I'm just trying to tell my story of how I did that and how it tipped from one side to the other. But I can totally see, Christine, why this was never a, a contest for you, um, because you've probably had like some fairly rock solid values all the way through, whereas I was on the side of the machines before. So I'm coming over to Team Human now. Plus, she cuts. She's Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, cool. Um, do you have some other question here that you want to pick up? Um... There was one, wasn't there? Where was it? Um, if um, here we can do this one, if the whole Bitcoin mine community was listening to you right now, uh, where was it? Yeah. Oh, uh, what would you suggest to them to reduce the ecological impact of Bitcoin mining? Well, I mean, uh, like again, like coming back to Christine's talk, discourse and discussion is the most important thing. So what happens now is a lot of kind of greenwashing where people in the Bitcoin mining industry are always saying, we use mostly green energy. It's mostly from dams and solar and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I really, the first, we have to start with an honest debate about what's going on here. And that is kind of what we're trying to do with the salon and with this provocation. And uh, the problem is most of the time when people bring this conversation to the Bitcoin community, they're coming from outside the community. And so people are, um, very skeptical of people coming from outside the Bitcoin community telling people how to fix Bitcoin because that's been going on since the start. Uh, and so maybe it's possible if people from that have some stature and some familiarity and expertise with how Bitcoin works and, and what it does and, and the people around it might bring up these points that we might be able to have a more substantive discussion. And that's the starting point, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, planet is burning while we wait to start these conversations. Yeah.